Hi, I'm Nick Wigall. I'm a clinical psychologist and writer. And in this video, I'm interviewing Dr. George Bonanno about his work on trauma and resilience. Dr. Bonanno has a PhD from Yale University, and he currently teaches at Columbia University. He's widely recognized as one of the world's foremost experts on trauma and resilience, and is among the top 1% most cited scientists in the world. In our conversation, we discuss a lot of things, including how to think clearly about trauma and PTSD, some common misconceptions about the nature of trauma. We get into what Dr. Bonanno calls the resilience paradox, including why resilience is actually much less of a trait than a lot of people think. And then we do kind of a deep dive into how resilient people respond to potentially traumatic events differently than others. It's a fascinating conversation, and I hope you enjoy. George Bonanno, welcome. Thanks, Nick. Very nice to, to be with you. All right, we'll start off with a softball. What is trauma? Trauma is a, and well, that's a very interesting question, actually, because it's thought of in different ways. It's often thought of as an event, and I like to qualify that by, I refer to events that are highly disturbing or violent or life-threatening as potentially traumatic events. These are events that could cause trauma, and there's been a lot of confusion in the, in the, in the literature, in, in the public, in society, because of events being considered traumas, which they're defined in the DSM, the, the Bible of Mental Disorders, you need to have, to get the diagnosis of PTSD, you must have experienced a traumatic event, right? And then you can have trauma. But a traumatic event is defined, and typically as, originally anyway, as a violent or life-threatening event that's outside the realm of normal human experience. Then that got a little bit that got broadened over time, what people call it bracket creep, lots of other things, because it became more and more subjective over time. And that's a big problem. It's been a big problem. But I use the word potentially traumatic to distinguish the fact that you can, we can all go through very difficult things, things that are potentially traumatic, but that doesn't necessarily mean we are then traumatized. And a trauma, a psychological trauma, which is different than a physical trauma, the psychological trauma is a prolonged period of elevated symptoms like PTSD. It's essentially a prolonged trauma reaction that you know lasts at least a month, maybe longer, and and then you are you are essentially struggling with trauma than psychological trauma. That's that's really helpful as a, as a starting point because, like you said, it's the the language and the dialogue. You know, on the one hand, it's wonderful that people are being more open and talking about trauma and I think mental health more generally, especially even just since I got out of grad school 10 years ago or so, it's because it's sure. changed a lot even just since then. On on the other hand, it it gets a little <laughs> it gets a little muddied, right? These when you hear people talking about even other mental health professionals, it gets kind of murky and confusing. So I appreciate the like the distinction between traumatic event versus a potentially traumatic event. And in your book, yes. you're very careful actually to to yeah. use that language, which I really like. But there's some other words, and you threw out some other words here that I always hear, and I, I, I wonder about these. So maybe, let me let me throw a couple terms by you from like the trauma vernacular. And I'm, sure, I'm curious sure. about your perspective on whether it's a kind of generally a helpful or unhelpful term. Not necessarily true or false or anything, but good or bad, but just do you find it a helpful way of thinking about trauma? And the, the first one I would say is traumatized. When someone says I was traumatized. I think probably that's not such a useful word, yes. I mean, it, professionally, it's not a word that is really used much. Right. You know, it, it tends to mean that an event, an, an event caused enduring psychological trauma, then you are traumatized, except the word traumatized itself is not precise and it's not used in any definitional sense. And it's used now in the general public kind of to mean I was really upset mm -hmm. by something. And being really upset is one thing being traumatized then it ties it to trauma and there's all kinds of confusion there when that happens so it's not yeah. such a... so it's like it's like when you hear people casually say you know i was so depressed like well you know yes. you were pretty sad like you were pretty upset <laughs> but it's a little different than yeah. you know yeah. clinical depression yeah. sure so Absolutely. i think w w one of the key distinction is like ptsd post-traumatic stress disorder versus the whole big kind of cloud of various kind of trauma related things. Yes. So what yes. are, let's just to kind of clarify things like, and, and you talk a lot about this, the, the, there are essentially three types of reactions to a potentially traumatic event. When you look at the research on how people respond, people who have encountered potentially traumatic events, things like, yes. like 
you know, people in New York during 9-11, right? Or people who experienced natural yes. disasters or physical violence, stuff like that. It's mm -hmm. usually, on average, it's usually around 90, 95% after a potentially traumatic event. And that's not, you know, that's an average. So that means sometimes it's lower. So the number of people that develop PTSD can range anywhere from about 5% to the absolute maximum, around 30%. 30% is a lot of people. It's gotcha. usually around 5, 10%. And then of those people that do not develop PTSD, there are different, there are other kinds of outcomes. Some people experience acute symptoms, high levels of symptoms initially. So they're struggling. And, but then they gradually get better over the course of a year, sometimes longer. That's a pattern we call the recovery pattern. That's different than chronic PTSD symptoms. And then there's another pattern we see where people are struggling, but they're, they're functioning, they're getting by, and then they gradually get worse. You see that pattern? Mm -hmm. Well, and then there's a pattern that we call resilience or the resilience trajectory that is around, on average, two-thirds. Sometimes it's a lot higher than that. But those people, people who show that pattern, they're pretty upset after, usually pretty upset after a violent or life-threatening event. It's very normal to be upset, to have a little period of maybe a nightmare, two nightmares, three nightmares, some intrusive thoughts, some sense of uneasiness that gives way after a few weeks or so, maybe a little longer, and then they continue to function normally. That's the pattern we call the resilience trajectory. And that lasts, I mean, that's a, sorry, that's usually around two thirds, sometimes more, sometimes less. Gotcha. That's, that's super helpful. Thank you for going. And I think that's, I think a lot of people who are hearing this are going to be, and people who've read your book are, it's, it's almost shocking because it's so counter to, like, if you, if, if you didn't know better, you would almost think the statistics are reversed the way people talk about. Absolutely. Trauma, yeah. That's what I right? think. Yeah. Yeah. So l let me let me ask you about that. What's what's your take on that? Like it, it, it actually here, let me frame it like this. I saw I was, <laughs> was on Twitter the other day and I saw a tweet that said, we all have trauma. What matters is being willing to confront it and manage it in a healthy way. Now, that especially the last part, it sounds nice and kind of vaguely like something anyone could kind of agree to. But but what do you make of this idea that that's very common, I think, out there that that we all have trauma? Yeah. And what um, is that? And where does that come from? Yeah, it's a common idea. I think I think it's a result of a lot of confusion or or sort of a, a history of confusions, if I can say that. Because it, the, the the epidemiological research, this is the research you know on huge swaths of the population that epidemiologists typically embrace. And in that research, it's been both in the United States and in Europe and in Scandinavia and many other places in Asia. Most people are exposed to an event that would qualify as a potential trauma. And in the DSM, it would be called a traumatic, a traumatic stressor. So most of us have been exposed to violent or life-threatening events, often multiple times in our lives. So I think that gives people the idea, because those are often called traumas. Mm -hmm. It gives people the idea that they have trauma in their past, they have hidden trauma. But in fact, the research shows very clearly for even decades of research that most people who expose those events are not, don't, do not suffer lasting trauma. So therefore, the idea that I think that's, a, that's where some of the confusion comes from. Most of us can recall something that would seem like a traumatic event, except it wasn't a traumatic event for most or these events are not traumatic events for most people. They're, they're not pleasant. They're horrible. They're scary. You know, they cause nightmares, as I mentioned before, but, they, but we, we move on past them. So I think there's just a lot of reasons. One is that we are wired to detect threat. You know, our brains are wired to detect threat for very good reasons. From an evolutionary standpoint, that's what would be really adaptive for us to pick out threats in the environment, to, to be cautious when we, feel, when we sense threat. So you take that kind of human animal that we are, then we do, you know, we discover PTSD, we, we, we formalize PTSD, and that happened in 1980, PTSD becomes a known thing. There's a trauma reaction you could have that could basically make it really hard to function for a long time. That's true. It does happen. You put that together with, the, with this thing that happened to us all called the internet. Where suddenly now everywhere you go, you can, you know, you on your phone, on your computer, you know, whatever you're doing, you can, you can be, you can be exposed to 
horrible things happening. And I think that really tweaks people. I think it makes people mm. think this is a dangerous, horrible world. And yes, I have been traumatized too. And I, I don't mean this to sound sarcastic. I hope I probably did, but because the fact is there are there are people in the world who are genuinely deeply traumatized. There, there are people who have been through something and suffer prolonged traumatic re- reactions. And those people then PTSD, and that's really difficult for those people. So I, you know, I, I think that's one of the byproducts of or one of the the unfortunate consequences of the sort of broadening of the idea of trauma to everyday problems is that it 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 fails to distinguish those kinds of experiences of people who really need help. So back to your question about the, the phrase we're all traumatized, um it doesn't really make any sense because we are all not traumatized. Or we all we all do not have trauma. I don't remember what the what the quote was, but we don't all have trauma. We've all been most all of us have been exposed to something that's potentially traumatic, and most of us have not been traumatized by it. No, that's helpful. I mean, and the the quote is we all have trauma, but it's that that word just trauma on its own is tricky because it's to me it's almost like an umbrella term. That's it's just sort of the carrier for all the different kind of more specific yeah. versions of, of yeah. that go into the trauma terminology. But it seems to me anyway, the big one seems to be a potentially traumatic event and then a traumatic reaction and, and yeah. distinguishing the lots, everybody, or just about everybody experiences potentially trauma, traumatic events, but that's a very different yes. thing than having a traumatic reaction of varying kind of intensities. Yeah, or exactly. Exactly. And, you know, and so, sometimes when I, I speak in public places on podcasts or, you know, on YouTube, wherever else, you know, it's publicly available. Sometimes people become annoyed or angry that I say the things I'm saying. And that, that I've seen some comments where people say, well, this guy, how does he know he's, he's clearly not been had a trauma. And I, you know, I don't usually answer those queries, those, those comments. But in fact, I've probably been exposed to more potential traumas than most people because I was young and very dumb when I was young, you know, and went around and did a lot, you know, left home when I was 17 and traveled around for years and made many, many mistakes before I ever decided to go to college, right? You know, mm. good 10 years. So those events, when I think back at them, you know, I could, those are clearly potentially traumatic events or times I, I could have died, you know, but, and I don't, but I don't think that's, it's that unusual again, because when you sure. look at the evidence, we've been through these things and, you know, they, they are what they are. They're potentially traumatic events that we moved on from. One of my favorite parts of your book is this section where you go back and you, you, you look at historically, you take this wide sweeping historical view of <clears throat> what we know from what's just what's been written down in human history, you go all the way back to like, you know, two, 3000 BC or when, when, you know, like the Iliad and the Odyssey were, were first mm-hmm. like being told and written down. And you, you, you know, when people, when you look carefully, actually you say the, the concept of psychological trauma seems to be a surprisingly modern idea. And you go back and you sort of look through all the text we have, people have been writing about war and potentially traumatic events for a long time. And if you look at those texts where people describe it, it's not like they're not describing people having difficult emotional yeah. reactions to things. Like the, the Iliad, for instance, is full of, you know, Achilles weeps and they talk about sadness and grief and anger and all these kind of emotional reactions. But there is nothing remotely close to what we would describe as PTSD. Being, right. Being yeah, noted. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But then you, it's really, the timeline to me is very intriguing. You say, it isn't really until about the industrial revolution when the word trauma, both physiologically, medically, but then also psychologically, barely starts to creep up. And really it isn't until like World War I with the idea of like shell shock and things like that, that the trauma itself starts to, and the descriptions of traumatic reactions start to show up. So what, what I'm really curious about is you draw this correlation between psychological trauma and and interestingly, like technological progress, the industrial revolution seems mm-hmm. to be where it starts to take off. So my question is, do you think that's a causal relationship? Good question. And I don't know if I 
they have an answer there. I think, you know, I, I don't really know why. I think we've experienced psychological trauma in the distant past. Mm -hmm. um, I could be wrong about that. I don't, there's no way to really know, but it, it certainly wasn't written about. One of my favorite examples is Samuel Pepys, I mentioned in the book, who in mm. the 17th century kept a diary that's been studied greatly by many people because he wrote with utter honesty, he didn't intend it to be read. So he talks about trauma symptoms, but he had no idea what was going on. And he was completely befuddled by it. Like, why am I having nightmares about this thing that happened six months ago? He was in the London fire. So in then, then in, the, in the Industrial Revolution, as, as you mentioned, we began late in the Industrial Revolution, late 19th century. The, for the first time, the word was used for a psychological reaction. But people began to have, I suppose it has to do with numbers. You know, there were always, you know, wars and there have always been horrific accidents and, you know, predators. But in the Industrial Revolution, you have a concentration of mm -hmm. you know, heavy equipment, people working long hours and lots of people around in cities. The Industrial Revolution brought people, really ramped up the concentration in cities. Uh, people from the country began to come into cities and populations grew. All this was happening at once. So whether it's Industrial Revolution or whatever confluence of historical facts, that there began to, people began to notice these uh, sort of repetitive symptom patterns. One of them was something called railway spine. You know, when railroads first began to appear on the scene when the, 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 the steam engine was invented and people began to ride in steam engines, aside from the fact that they were absolutely filthy, you know, because of belching all this smoke right back into where the, the cars were, they were, there were horrific accidents until they figured out the proper safety mm -hmm. mechanisms. You know, the, the, the coupling device that when two train cars or two railroad cars are put together, they move side to side and that's to handle the turns, but it's also to make the cars go sideways if there's an accident so they don't telescope into each other. So there is what they did to telescope into each other before that, which is, uh, you know, ghastly to think about. So there were these horrific accidents and people began to show signs of sort of unexplained psychological reactions to these things, which sound a lot like PTSD. Um, but there was no explanation. So at first, people were looking for an explanation. And they tried micro lesions of the spine was one. that There, there are lesions of the spine that we just can't see. You, in, in those days, you couldn't see the spine anyway, because that's a hugely dangerous thing to do even now, to, to you know, cut somebody open to look at the spine. But it, you know, it was an attempt to begin to try to explain these things. And finally, as you mentioned, then the, the World War II happened. And you know, we had a lot of people with what appeared to be psychological reactions that still was people we were very unsure about. You know, it took a while before, I think, as a society, we said, okay, this is real. You, you mentioned a little bit earlier that the what we think of now as PTSD wasn't really formalized until the 80s in, in DSM, in DSM, what, three or two or three? DSM like three, yeah. Three, right. okay. In DSM five, there was an interesting move where... PTSD had traditionally been located under the anxiety disorders. It was considered an anxiety disorder, right? And then it got moved into its own category of, I forget what it's called, trauma unrelated or something like that. There, there's mm -hmm. sort of another category, a trauma category. Mm -hmm. What do you think of this move? Because I, I'm, I'm not a trauma expert. I, I'm an, I specialize in anxiety specifically. And to me, it only, mechanistically, it made a lot of sense that, that what seemed to perpetuate PTSD seemed very similar to what tends to perpetuate a lot of anxiety disorders, things like yeah. panic disorder, stuff like that. Yeah. So I'm I'm curious, how do you think of that move when they decided to move it into its own category? Well, to be to be perfectly honest with you, um, I don't care at all, and I don't have an opinion about it. I don't. I'm not a huge fan of diagnoses. I think this is my take on this is my take on diagnoses. I hope I don't offend anybody by saying this. I think diagnoses, psychiatric diagnoses, are societal tools. We use them to decide whether somebody can have treatment and for what and who will pay for it. Mm. Um, but you, what typically in our system, in most healthcare systems, you need a diagnosis in order to have treatment. So you need, you need psychological diagnoses or psychiatric diagnoses 
in order to both assign and pay for treatment. Um, I think that to finish that that what this the statement, psychiatric diagnoses are societal tools masquerading as scientific concepts. I don't mm-hmm. think they're very scientific, and they're certainly not biological. There's a kind of a myth that there is an underlying biology to all of these disorders. There, you can look at, you can identify neural n- neuroanatomical reactions or neuroanatomical differences associated with different disorders, but they're not diagnostic. They're really consequential, usually, mm-hmm. and um, so they're 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 really just it, it. It's really just a matter of what works better for the societal purpose. You know, I don't think we, we're not getting at much mechanism by doing that. Yeah, it's interesting. It's one of those you can sort of tell the how sophisticated a field in medicine is by whether they define their 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 pathologies descriptively or mechanistically. And we clearly yeah. just aren't sophisticated enough yet to describe yeah. our, our and, and pathologies. The, the truth is the truth is that the DSM diagnoses are determined by a lot of arguing and fighting hmm. rather than data, I think. Um, hmm. And I've seen a little bit of that and it's 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 a little discouraging to see it, but that's that's kind of how it works out. Well, it's, it, it's, it's interesting too, because to some extent it, it informs how people, like I think about clinicians like myself, like how people go about helping folks with, with who, who are experiencing PTSD or, or other kind of trauma related reactions. But anyway, it's, it's interesting. Trauma has become sort of a, a category of its own. If, if anything, yeah. it's kind of reflective of our culturally, how we're thinking about trauma. Yeah. You know, what's, what's interesting is that the, the, the other diagnostic category system, which is the International Classification of Disorders, mm-hmm. the ICE, which is used by most of the world and actually was going to be used in the U.S. at one point. And then there was a lot of lobbying and political maneuvering to keep the DSM as the, the main focus, or the main focal point of, of diagnoses in the U.S. But the ICD is much um, less prescriptive in their diagnostic descriptions. Mm. The U.S. in the, the DC, DSM says to have PTSD, you need this, you need X, and then you need two of these and three of these and two of these. And, and the PTSD diagnosis is one of the more complicated diagnoses in the DSM, which makes it also one of the least reliable. It's got a lot right. of too much variability in it. But the ICD doesn't say, doesn't prescribe any kind of algorithm. It says, this is what it is. Here are the symptoms you typically see and leaves it at that. It doesn't say two of these and three of these, and it's not so prescriptive. And it turns out in a few studies where people actually clearly had disorders and then people were given the DSM or the ICD to diagnose them, the ICD turned out to be more accurate, more reliable. Yeah, because it's 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 built on the premise that clinicians will know what the diagnosis is mm-hmm. based on talking with someone, not so much on whether it fits this exact prescription. So that that also argues that, you know, sort of debates about whether it's this or this or these small nuances, I don't think they're very important. Really. You have something in the book called The Resilience Paradox. And I'm, yeah. I'm going to quote you here because I think it's really important. Um, we can identify statistical correlates of resilience, the so-called traits of resilient people. But paradoxically, when something aversive happens, those correlates don't actually tell us much about who will be resilient and who won't. So I want, I do in a second, I want to talk about resilience itself, but for, I want to use this as a jumping off point to ask about PTSD specifically, do we, how good are we at predicting who will develop PTSD post potentially traumatic events? Like, do we know what the variables are that increase likelihood for developing PTSD? And is that, I'm, I'm not totally sure if that's the same question as do we know who will be resilient? After yeah, that? like, do we? Do... Yeah, it's a wonderful question. Nick. Wonderful question, and it's it's some extent the same. I haven't probed the, the prediction of PTSD recently. I haven't kept up with it because I'm mostly focused in my work on resilience. Mm-hmm. But the last I looked, it was the exact same problem. The things that we can identify that correlate with PTSD all have what we we say in in in, in the academia, small effects, small effect sizes. What that means is they they might correlate with, you know, if you have this, you have a certain statistically significant likelihood of developing PTSD, but that size of that effect is very small, meaning it only predicts a little bit what 
that we're, yeah. how likely one will be. Um, and that's the case for resilience as well. So that we know of things that correlate with PTSD, but it, it's not, we're not very good at predicting who will get PTSD. Yeah, it's fascinating. It's, it's, it's really interesting. Okay, well, that was, because yeah. my line of thinking there was, um, you know, one way to help folks, which you talk a lot about in the book and that we'll, we'll get to is how can we develop resilience? How can we th think more yeah. about resilience? And, but the, the other way of thinking about it too is how can we sort of remediate vulnerabilities, right? If there yeah, are absolutely. kind of internal vulnerabilities, yeah. Yeah. can we, can we identify and remediate those? Yeah. It sounds like so, what you're saying is, anyway, go ahead, go ahead. No, no. So the, I think there's a, there's a factor to consider in that regard that's really mm. important. And it gets back to what we were discussing earlier about you know, what potentially traumatic events that we tend to think of, you know, trauma as a category. And, you know, when you have a trauma, when two, three, four, five, ten people have traumas, that they're all having the same reaction to the same kind of event. And in fact, that's not at all true. The different things that we confront in our lives are, mar are remarkably different, even in the same person. So you might experience an automobile accident. You might experience a natural disaster. You might, you know, injure yourself with a cooking, you know, or, or you know, have a, or something happens to somebody very close to you, or, or you see, a, you know, a violent episode on the street. All of these things are extremely different. And the challenges are extremely different. And how we react to them, how we deal with them, how we cope with them are extremely different. And what, what I've done in my work with resilience is we, we instead of focusing on, on PTSD so much, we've focused on the majority of people who are resilient and ask the question, so why are these people resilient? Why are so many people resilient? What are they doing? And that then allows us to begin to speculate, to begin to think a little bit differently about why then some people get PTSD. Mm. Why are some people not resilient? And when I say not resilient, I don't mean the people themselves are not resilient. What I mean is that they weren't resilient this time because a person is not resilient as a, as a trait. A person is resilient this time in, in response to something. We can only be resilient or not resilient in response to something. So a person is resilient to this per particular event. They may not be you know, to this next event that happens two years later. And in fact, they may develop PTSD reactions. That's so not actually, yeah, can, can I ask you about that? Cause I, I had a, sure. I was wondering about that when I was reading the book in, in that, like how domain specific or general is resilience? Like if you had, if you had w within a specific person, so it's one thing to think about it, it among like, as a, as a, you know, an average of a whole group of people. But like, if you had a person who was exposed to 10 different potentially traumatic events over the span of 10 years, right? What percentage of the time would you expect resilience versus the non-resilience? Is it just that like, well, each at each event, you you're, you reset the odds and it's just whatever happens, happens. Or is there something about people who, if if I am resilient to this first traumatic event, potentially traumatic event that I experience, Am I therefore, am I going to be more, even slightly more likely to be resilient yeah. to future ones? Yeah, that, it, that's a fantastic question. And I, I only have a partial answer to that because I'm moving towards, and in my work for the last 10 years or so, we've focused on what I've called regulatory flexibility or flexible self-regulation, mm -hmm. which I think is the, is the mechanism and it's the process that we go through in order to find a resilient outcome. And that is a, that's not a trait, although we can develop mm. skills in, in flexibility, but we have to use it each time. In other words, every time there's a challenge, we have to deal with that challenge on its own terms. Every time we're exposed to a potential traumatic event, we have to deal with it on its own terms and find our way through it. Some events may be particularly difficult for a person, so that person's going to have a little bit of a harder time. You know, they may be their history or what they've been through before. You know, and there are many different factors that come into play. For example, we know that if a person's been through an event, they the next time they're through, they go through an event like that, they kind of know what to expect, which mm. gives them a little bit of an, a little bit of a helping hand. They're it's less frightening. They have they have a better sense of being in control of that event. So they're the odds of 
coping well or doing well will be increased. That's a kind of a, we can't, we have very little, little control over that in our lives because the things we're exposed to for some, we have, we have some influence on it, but a lot of things happen randomly. But I think, you know, saying if a person's exposed to 10 things in 10 years, we could just say as a, just purely statistically, they have a two thirds chance of being resilient on, you know, two thirds of them, you know, each time. And, you know, you could do literally do a gambling task where, you know, yeah. you spin the dice each time. But then there's also this concept of flexibility, which gives people the skills to try to find their way through the event. And some people have those skills more than others. Most people have are reasonably flexible. It's the way our mind works. Our mind is very adaptable. So, you know, it's it's. I'm not in a position of, in a point yet where I would put a number on it, but I think what sure. we, we can increase our odds of being resilient by becoming more flexible is something I'm very interested in now, but we have to do it each time. And I like to use the metaphor of say of a sports figure, a sports star who's got a lot of talent, but they don't always win or they don't always do well because they have to be motivated. You know, they have to be, you know, they have to be healthy at the time. So, you know, Flexibility, this concept I'm interested in is is kind of seems to be the mechanism in that which we do it, mm -hmm. but we have to use it each time and we have to be willing and able to do it each time. So there's a lot let's, going on. Yeah. So let's let's talk about that. I, I'm I'm really interested to get into this because it's 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 complicated but really important. So the first mm -hmm. is there, there's this layer of like resilience. And I think we can hopefully we can kind of dispel this idea that there's like some people just have the resilience gene and some people don't, and like that's there's some magical yeah. trait of resilience like that's clearly not going on but there there then there is this level of there are things we know are associated statistically with resilience so you know yeah. seeking out and utilizing social support or various emotion regulation strategies or you know mm -hmm. what, even just you know like i i don't know some of the one you you would know better but like having access to resources right financial yeah. resources all, all yeah. sorts of things right many things um, yeah but so that's another layer of things associated with resilience but then this this idea of flexibility and correct me if i'm wrong but but it seems to me the way i think about this is flexibility is how skilled are you at using those particular resources and and skills in a way that's adaptive given this particular potentially traumatic yeah. event right so yeah. there's 20 potential things i could do in the face of a tr potentially traumatic event being flexible is about realizing given the particulars of this circumstances i'm going to i'm going to use option you know a c and h but not b and b because it seems like that's going to be the most effective here mm -hmm. is that yeah is that that's is that well the way said yeah yeah it? yeah that you're you're in the ball very much in the ballpark in the ballpark okay yeah no no <laughs> it's, it's i mean I, maybe that's not generous that's more or less the idea so we you know of course i do a lot of research so we've we've broken this down in all kinds of pieces and we have thought about the different components but in a nutshell what we call flexible self-regulation is figuring out the right behavior to use in the right time for the right event and that that requires that we you know we engage with what's happening to us and we do try to figure out what's going to work here and we don't always get it right so we try something and we then we correct a lot of it is is trial and error and I think that's where many people stumble over the idea of trial and error, because there's this assumption that resilient people just know what's going on. They know how to do it, and they're just plain resilient. That's not true. People, uh, resilient people, people who find the way to resilience seem to have to do the, be flexible. So they kind of work out what's likely to get me through in this event, and I'll try it. If it doesn't work, then I'm going to rethink it a little bit and try something else. Yeah, you talk, you, you break down the this well, you, in the book, what you call the flexibility sequence, which mm -hmm. are these kind of like three stages, right? Which are context sensitivity, like being aware of mm -hmm. the particulars of the of this, you know, your particular potentially traumatic event. Repertoire, which is like your skill cool. what you have available. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. To, yeah, you know, yeah. And, and then the last one, which I, in some ways I think is the most interesting, which is feedback monitoring. Yeah. So you're aware of what happens. You try some stuff. But then you're, 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 you intuit, okay, I tried X and that didn't work very well. So I'm going to try something yeah. different. Right? And what, what strikes me is this is, this is to me anyway, <laughs> remarkably similar to, this is like the scientific method. 
you're, you're observing and gathering data. Mm -hmm. You form kind of a theory that, and you, you try it out. You say, okay, I'm going to try and do, I'm, you know, you use the, the example in the book of the guy who gets mugged in the park and then starts to have a lot of like traumatic reactions to that, including like he isolates, he stays in his apartment and doesn't mm -hmm. want to go out because he's afraid of getting mm -hmm. mugged again. But eventually he kind of gathers up that he, he, he goes out and it's very hard and it's stressful, but he does it for the first time anyway. And so he sort of learns like, okay, I can do this. Things get better when mm -hmm. I start reaching out and connecting. But, but anyway, to me, it just, it, it was kind of a light bulb moment when I thought this flexibility sequence, like this, this is like science. This is what <laughs> we're, we're observing yeah. carefully. We're formulating a theory, but then most importantly, like we're testing it and readjusting to yeah. see whether it works or not. Yeah, um, very, very much. It's very well said. Perfect. You got it. Yeah. But yeah. I think often, like, I, I wonder a lot about that third step and because yeah. you see a lot of people are aware and they try lots of stuff, but at least in my practice, when I, when I worked with, with people, not necessarily with PTSD, but through any sort of emotional mm -hmm. difficulty. One of the things I felt like we spent a lot of time on is helping people generate this like sensitivity to feedback and then adjusting yeah. flexibility, which yeah. is a hard kind of meta skill almost. Yeah, you know, and it really is the key because I mean all this all three of these steps are important. But even in the research world, you know, there's been a lot of study, decades of study on coping and emotion regulation. Hardly mm -hmm. any study of this of adjusting coping and emotional regulation strategies. Yeah. So when we started to formulate this, we, we created a couple of experimental paradigms so we could measure it. And there's a little bit of questionnaire work we can get at it. So now we've been measuring that and we can see very clearly yeah. that's what people are doing. And I think what, what's interesting is our brains are completely amenable to this. And I really like to point this out to people. We have we have the longest period of development in the animal kingdom, 25 years till, till our brains are mature. We have the largest number of cortical neurons. So we have an enormous cortical structure. And that long period of development is an evolutionary strategy. You know, they're, they're two basic evolutionary strategies. Animals are born kind of ready to go. I use the example in the book of a goat. You know, goats yeah. are born, their mother licks them for a while, you get the amniotic fluid out, and then they stand up and they, they you know, make a sound and they can literally walk away. Humans, of course, can't do that for years. It's a couple of years before we can really do something like that. We take our first steps. What is it? Around a year, right? And so, but we can barely do that. We can't really have a conversation. You know, we're helpless. That's because... We then, it, I mean, there are many factors why that is, but it allows us to grow and learn in, in a tremendously drawn out way that, that is basically kind of a built-in flexibility. We are adaptable. We can change. We can modify as we grow older. And we learn to do that. We learn to adapt to the world that we are confronted mm -hmm. with. So it really is innately human to be able to do this. And I think we've gotten to the point for whatever reason where we just don't think we can, you know, and I like to point it out to people that, yeah, this is what we do, you know, try something else, you know, and it, it's how we're built. So the, the obstacle that came up to me when I was reading about, especially this third stage, the feedback monitoring is, I was thinking about, again, about the, the story you, you tell really well in the book about the, the, the gentleman who gets mugged in the park. Um, he he goes, he start. he decides after isolating for a long time, he decides to go back out again, but it's really hard. Like it's a really kind of yeah. miserable experience yeah, the first time yeah. he go. he ventures back out again. Yeah. So th in my question, I'm, in my head, I'm like, well, okay, this guy went out and he, for some reason he interpreted that as, well, it was hard, but like, look, I did it. Like I can do it. Right. And it led yeah. to the feedback he interpreted was like, I'm strong enough to kind of overcome this. I can keep going. But it's not hard to imagine how a lot of people would have taken that as like, ooh, this is bad. I should not go back out again. It's really hard. Yeah. I feel super anxious. Yeah. Like I'm going to stay in again. Yeah. So there's this question of how, like, it seems like so much of the feedback tilts on short-term versus long-term. Like there are so many things that in the short-term feel really bad, but are actually good for us, right? Like, Well, this is, the way this is, this all has to do with the entire, what I call the flexibility sequence, as you mentioned, because the feedback part doesn't happen in isolation. We start at the beginning with, in context sensitivity, we read 
the situation. And, and the key part there is to focus on the present. If we mm. think about, you know, all right, I've just had this horrible thing happen. I'm having nightmares. I'm really anxious. I can't sleep. We tend to telescope out to the future and think, I, my life is ruined. I'm, this mm. is terrible. You know, but that's, that's actually not focusing on the context. The context is the one right where we are. And we have to zero in and say, what's happening right now? What do I need to do? And then in that case, the problem would be, okay, I can't go because I'm frightened to go out of my apartment. So that becomes the problem in a sense. Not that my life is messed up. This horrible thing happened. The problem is I can't get myself out of the apartment. And that's what happened in the vignette I told in the book. He felt like I have to get out of the apartment. Then you you then go on to the next step, the repertoire board, and you say, okay, so what tools do I have to be able to do that? And you try some different things. So getting yourself out of the apartment is the goal, right? And so right. I said, all right, I got myself out of the apartment and I was terribly anxious, but I did it. So in that case, he, so he could see it as a positive because it fit the goal that he had set. The moment mm-hmm. in that moment, getting out of the apartment was the task. It sucked. It was very unpleasant, but he did it. You know, he had a run in with somebody that was also very unpleasant because he had some bruises on his face and he wondered how people would react, but he did it. So in a sense, then there's a little bit of mastery that comes with that. That's a positive. You know, I, I, I needed to do this thing and I did it. So now, you know, now I can try again. I can maybe set the next goal. So what's happening now? Well, now I maybe need to try again, get out again. I'll do that. Right. So, you know, that's really a very important piece of this because we if we're feeling seriously anxious or whatever it is that whatever other kind of problem we might be struggling with and we try to do the whole thing at once it's not likely to be successful because there are too many other things going on but if we just simply focus on one piece at a time we also we get to feel that accomplishment and that helps us go on to the next piece I can relate to that so much working with folks with, with anxiety is it's the standard is so incredibly high. If, if it's like everything has to go perfectly and I have to, yes. but, yeah. so chunking your, your unit of yeah. progress to something manager, yeah. like is such a, in some ways it's such a obvious, like it's not a complicated thing, but it's surprisingly yeah. easy to miss. And the, the other thing you, I think you mentioned that, that is really subtle, but really important is defining success based on behavior, not on how I feel. Right, so this guy he interpreted as a, interpreted it as a success because he did the thing. He went out, even though he was afraid. Yeah. But if his, if his version of success had been, I need to be able to go out and feel really confident, it, he would have interpreted it as a failure, right? Because he didn't feel he felt anxious yeah. and afraid yeah. when he went out. So right. that that's such a subtle thing, but it seems like that one of many probably factors in do are people able to respond resilient, right. resiliently? And he can do that later. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I interrupted you. No, just, uh, just this. He, for whatever reason, he defined his goal yeah. behaviorally, yeah. not yeah. emotionally, which yeah. is, it's not like that. That wouldn't be necessarily obvious or intuitive to a lot of people. And so, right. well, he could, he can define it emotionally later, maybe, you know, so, all right, I, mm-hmm. I got out now. Now I am, now I want to go out and be a little more confident when I go out. You know, he can do sure. that later. It's another step, right? But for at, at, at that moment, it was, yeah, just behavioral. I just need to get out of the apartment. And I, I believe, you know, I'm, I'm actually now struggling to remember what actually, what he actually did and what, what, the, what, what happened in the book because it was now a while ago that I wrote that. But I do remember he was staring out the window and watching people walking. And he thought, well, why I can do that. Why am I not doing that? And that was really me. That led to him just think, I just have to get out, make myself. That's another get out. one. I think that's a really fast. The degree, something I noticed with my own clients is some people seemed really good at using role models. Like they would see other people doing something that they want, and they would use that as, oh look, like I can do that. That's a model for me, and it would help kind mm-hmm. of shake them mm-hmm. out of. But then interesting, like some people, it was almost the reverse. They'd see people and they think, oh my God, I could never do that. Look how successful those people are. And I'm and some schmuck and I can't. <laughs> so it's it's so interesting how, yeah, the variety in in, in different people's Yeah, and, and, and you know, when, we, well, when we've studied this in people, what we find is that most people, the majority, are have at least a moderate degree of skill in all three of these pieces of the flexibility sequence. But then there are deficits. 
And when people have deficits, mm-hmm. they typically have deficits in want. And some people, typically people who are more anxious, tend to have deficits in the context sensitivity part. So they mm-hmm. do have a difficult time, more of a difficult time than other people reading the situation and sort of picking up the cues of what's really happening. What do, and we, and we, and I, I put it in, in the book in terms of self-talk, like questions we can ask yeah. ourselves, what's happening and what do I need to do? And we, that's a, those are questions that we need to answer before we can move forward. So what's happening is, you know, I'm traumatized. I can't function. No, that, well, that's happening, but that's again, too large. What's happening right now. And then mm-hmm. that we can say, you know, okay, if what's happening right now is I need to get out then I, we, I can do that. If what's happening now is I need to be able to walk down the street as if nothing in the world has happened, that's maybe a little too bold, little too bold right? So, you know, we think hard a little bit about that. What is happening? You All know? right, I've got, you've been very generous with your time. I've got some final questions for you. These sure. are in my notes. They're under the miscellaneous category. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> the first one is maybe not totally miscellaneous, but this, I feel like this question is either going to be after I ask it, it's either going to be a very dumb question or a, a pretty good question. But <laughs> why why call the book the end of trauma? Ah, that's a good question. That was really God. How much do I want to say about this? This was, I think, I don't remember anymore what the title I started out with was for the book. So I went up and down and inside and out with my <laughs> publisher about what the book would be called. And it was a very, turned out to be a very hard book to title. And I think probably in retrospect, a better title would have been How Resilience Really Works or something like that. But there was a real interest in also addressing this idea that trauma is ubiquitous now, this sort of myth about trauma. Mm-hmm. And so the, t- the title is a little bit tongue in cheek. So I don't, you know, it, at some point we came up with this title and I, and I was worn out from titles. I said, fine, whatever, <laughs> this title this title's good. And uh, well, yeah. I love it because I, I can't, it, it, it keeps me coming back to it and I can't quite figure out what it means, yeah, but yeah. I, want, I keep, it makes me want to continue to yeah. think about like this idea, right. what, what would that mean to the yeah. end of trauma? Like what is that? Right. So I think it really, yeah, so it, it does imagine imply... a lot of people misinterpreting it, but I also think it's very generative if you're willing to kind of hold it and right. just, Use exactly it to, to meditate right. on, and I think that it does have that ambiguity, and and that is a really good thing, yeah, because yeah. it allows us to to ponder the questions more. Yeah, yeah. You in the acknowledgement section of your book, you you thank Lisa Feldman Barrett, and you, yes. you, you say specifically you thank her for her friendship and her all around awesome mind. So I I don't know Lisa personally, but I'm a big fan. I, I love her book, How Emotions Are Made. Mm-hmm. But this idea of her awesome mind, that, that definitely got me, uh, got me curious. What, to, what's the most like unique or kind of intriguing thing about the way she thinks? Well, Lisa is a, Lisa just is an absolutely raw intelligence. She's, she's really got the, I mean, the, probably the sharpest mind I've ever encountered. Mm. And I think her, her I, I once joked with her about this. I have, I've known her for a long time. We're friends. And I've introduced her a few times at conferences and, and, you know, I've invited her to speak at Columbia before. I think I once said I'd read something she wrote in a book and it, I thought this should be chiseled above the entrance to every psychology department in the world, except I can't remember what it was because it was it was beyond my little brain to remember it, you know, and I think that's kind of where we're we're. we're what I would say about Lisa. Oh, here's another example. We were once at a conference at, at, and we were late into the day and we began to debate something. We, it didn't even seem like a debate. We were discussing something, some research finding. And she thought it wasn't very worthwhile. And I, I took the opposite position. I said, no, this is a really interesting finding. And we talked about it a while and then went, you know, went, to our, went, to, went our separate ways at the end of the day. The next day over breakfast with some colleagues, I said that I would never want to debate Lisa because she's just too smart. And she said, what are you talking about? You won that debate last night. And I thought, well, that's just, a, that really illustrates how smart she is. Because if I won the debate, I didn't know it. Mm. You know, so <laughs> I had no idea that I had won the debate. So I think, you know, that's a testimony to her. And she's done really remarkable things, I think, yeah. in the field. And, and to bring attention to concepts that we take for granted and, you know, I think a lot of her work will have repercussions for, for years to come and when we catch up with it. 
Yeah. Well, yeah. It's, it's interesting that you both are friends because I, I have a very similar reaction to, to both of um, your books that, that I've read by, by each of you, which is that, you know, a, a good book gives you lots of interesting ideas to, to kind of ponder, but, but a, kind of a great book, it, you get a window into how a really impressive thinker thinks. You learn to think like someone else in a really impressive way. And I think that I'm, I was very conscious of both of, with both of you in, in your books. That's a, it's a very, very kind compliment. Thank you. Well, yeah. There's another part toward the end of the book, you have a, your last chapter is on the pandemic, right? The pandemic hit right as you were kind of yeah. finishing up this book. And you talk about how one of your kind of go-to strategies for keeping yourself sort of sane and balanced, especially in a difficult time like that, was exercise. And I'm, I'm very much the same way. But th this, this, people have talked about this a lot more recently, that the beneficial effects of exercise, not just on physical health, but on emotional health and mental health. There's articles every day about how exercise helps with depression and anxiety yeah. and all sorts of things. Why is that though? Like what, I, there's so many potential reasons for everything from like yeah. endogenous opioid releases, making you feel good to increase self-efficacy to distracting you from negative thought. Yeah. I don't know. There's also, so, and I'm sure it's one of these things like resilience where there's a bajillion things that all have a combined effect. Yeah, yeah. If, yeah. if you had to like create a relatively simple model, like is in as few dimensions as possible, what do you think is going on under the yeah. hood there? I mean, I've asked a lot of sports physiologists and whatnot, and I do what's called cold exposure. So I run outside mm. in the wintertime in, in as much bare skin as possible, you know, the, the minimum amount of clothing that will keep me from being arrested. And I run out in, you know, freezing weather, you know, routinely on ice and things. And why is that helpful? And I, I, I think the best I can come up with is that you activate some very, very basic Let's just say phylogenetically ancient bodily system. Mm. When I say phylogenetically ancient, I mean systems that go way back in our evolutionary history that, that we share with some other mammals. Sure. You know, the things that regulate our body temperature and the things that regulate our mental state. And we intentionally manipulate them in a sense. So we could we learn to we learn about those systems and we learn to control them. So when when you put yourself through a workout, you're making yourself do something. You're pushing your body and you need to control your mind to do that. You need to have, you know, you need to focus, you need to, you know, to, and you have to attend your body. So you're a sense learning and controlling these very powerful automatic reactions that we normally go through. So essentially you're going through a major work that is essentially like running from a predator. It's like a stress yeah. response and right. you're in control of it. You're, and you manipulate it and you get it under control. And I think that's the essence of it. Um, that's interesting. It's almost like you're, it's like you're doing dress rehearsals for stress, for dealing yeah. with stress, right? You're yeah. And you're, you're synchronizing it in a way. Yeah. yeah. And I, I mean, that's, that's, I think a sensible argument and it, I don't, I don't think I understand it beyond that, but I think that's kind of what it is. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. You, I think you are, you are from, you mentioned you're from Chicago originally. What do you, I spent um, a few years in Chicago and during grad, doing grad school, and I'm so nostalgic for Chicago. I miss it so often. I'm curious for you, what do you miss most about Chicago, not having lived there for a while? People are very nice. Midwestern people are very nice. Chicago is a beautiful city architecturally, big muscular city. Yeah, I think it just has a certain character that, it, that, that other big cities don't have because it's, it's in the Midwest and, you know, and, and it's muscular. It's a very muscular city. A very industrial city at one point. I love that. I think there's so many cities I've I've spent time in that are they're beautiful in a in the big sense of the word or the general. So like San Francisco is a beautiful city in a lot of ways, but like the city itself, the buildings, the streets, the like, eh, I don't know. I don't think they're that. But Chicago is like I used to just wander around Chicago. Like it was the city itself is like so just like you said, architecturally, structurally, so beautiful. Yeah. I think that's I think that's wonderful. Yeah. What about, and we're getting, I'm closing in here, but I'm just so intrigued. You, you mentioned on your, in your website, your little bio section, you talk about how you're a painter and you, you, during grad school, you said I continued painting off and on over those years, but to my surprise, while earning my PhD, my output accelerated. Yeah. Now this, this struck, this struck me because when I started my PhD program, I, I decided to start a little wedding photography business on the side. I'd always loved photography and I decided to. And part of that was financial, like I wanted to repay my student loans faster. But part of it was like some, like I need in an, an intensely sort of analytical time, I, I felt like I needed more, even more of a creative out, even though I didn't have a lot of extra time <laughs> doing my PhD. 
So it felt like I just had to do something more creative. So I'm, I'm just curious from your perspective, like, why do you think that was? Why did your painting output increase during a time when presumably um, you were a lot busier than you had been before? Yeah, I, I love the question. Thanks for asking that question because I hadn't given it that much thought. I think that the, the, the reason that leaps to mind is that it was a very rich time in my life. You know, having a, an identity as, a, as an intellectual person and as a, a person who appreciates art. And when I was younger, that caused a lot of conflict because my mostly my father was a Sicilian immigrant and really did not thought I was was he did did not appreciate my focus on reading and painting and things so I was painting as a teenager caused a lot of conflict and I I left home for many years 10 years and you know traveled around without ever going to college so I finally did go, begin to go to school and then before I that happened very quickly I was incredibly insecure about my intellectual abilities. And before I knew it, I was getting a PhD at Yale. And that was enormously rewarding. And I think, you know, I had this sense of, of, of excitement and, you know, boundless potential that you can only mm. feel when you're young, you know, the sense of I can do things. So the painting was something I've always loved to do. And I was actually exploring it to see whether I could perhaps even go that route for my career because I love painting. I've always loved it. I love color. One of the few things I could simply do when I was young, you know, without training. And I probably would have considered pursuing it if it weren't the fact that I was studying portraiture. I was painting portraits and landscapes. And this was in the 1980s. And nobody was interested in portraits and landscapes in the 1980s, right? So, and I remember thinking, I'm not thick-skinned enough to do that, to endure that. And psychology was also seemed like a very compelling career. And it in fact has been. So, you know, the decision wasn't that difficult, but I think just the sheer, you know, I, I probably answered that question in a much more elaborate way than I needed to, but it was an exciting time it. in my life, you know? So, yeah. I also, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a genetically short sleeper. I don't sleep more than six hours usually, mm -hmm. and sometimes less, which makes it easier to do things like paint also. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Sure, sure. All right. Well, thank you, George. I really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. Very nice. Um, very nice so to much. talk with you. Yeah, I really appreciate the, the, the conversation. It was really a pleasure. If you enjoyed this video and want to get more of my thoughts on anxiety, confidence, resilience, and related topics in emotional health, I write a weekly newsletter called The Friendly Mind, which you can join for free using the link in the description below. Thanks.